Welcome to you who are joining us online. Grateful that you're with us either now or down the road. And we are grateful to be here today to be with God and God's people on God's day, the Lord's day. Uh, this morning's message is called When Tragedy Hits Home. It's connected to the fact that many of us are remembering September 11th today. It's 21 years ago today that that happened. Uh, with the guys yesterday, one of the things I, I shared, I don't know if you've ever seen this picture, but it, it was, uh, I believe it was taken in Poland uh, probably in the early 40s. Uh, but what it is, is a picture from inside like an apartment through the window of the apartment to the building next door. Uh, and on the building next door is this huge flag with a swastika on it. I mean, huge flag. Uh, Hitler's goal was to dominate and the whole world. But what is so striking about this picture is that through the, through the glass in the apartment where the picture is being taken of the building next door, on the ledge of the glass is a menorah, which, of course, is the, a, a Jewish symbol connected to the Prince of Peace. And guess what are still being put all over the place, and guess what isn't hanging any place anymore, right? Nobody's putting it, well, sick people are embracing that flag, but that flag is not raised, is not raised anymore because Hitler's dead, and the Third Reich rose, and the Third Reich left. But that menorah that represents the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who is eternal, through whom uh, his son came to the world, and now the Prince of Peace is, uh, is in place. Uh, it's just, it was just staggering to be reminded of that picture. Because if you take a picture of that flag, you think, well, that, that's, they're winning. They're, they're going to win. No, this little teeny symbol of the peace that only God can, can give uh, took down that flag eventually. And that's another important life lesson, to not, judge, not judge what will be by what is or what has been. Heartache is an inevitable part uh, of life in, in this world in which we live. Now, I know that isn't news to you. It's just an affirmation of a reality. Some heartache comes from the horrible things that God allows. Some comes from the consequences of what others have done. And some comes from the consequences of what we have done. But it all gets our attention, and its impact will change us in one way or another. The heartache that accompanies our, our walk here in, in life. Think of all the tragedies that I've occurred in just the last hundred years. A short list, 9-11. To the 1972 Olympics in Munich, remember those? Those hostages that were taken and how that ended? The Holocaust, I've already mentioned that. The, the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, you remember that? Devastated, just a wall of water and life was never the same for so many. Yesterday's 7.7 .7 earthquake in Papua New Guinea. The Murrah Federal Building, the bombing on April 19, 1995 in Oklahoma City. The invasion of Ukraine. The school shootings in Chardon, Ohio, in Columbine, Colorado, in Uvalde, Texas, to name just a few of the dozens and dozens of them there have been. And all that to say, that life will punch you in the gut and punch you in the heart. And, and as, as brutal as the beginning of this message it has been, what, what we really hope to get to today and to see is what the second point, and I'll just give you the second point before the message even begins. When tragedy hits home, we do well to remember that all that harms, harasses, hurts, and hinders here is passing. That's where we want to get to, and that's what we want to hold on to when the next tragedy comes for this nation or for this world or for you. To understand that all that harms or harasses or hurts or hinders here in this life has a shelf life, and it will not be forever. And that's a, a, a great comfort, which then can allow us to say, for now, we press on, right? We press on. The best is yet to come. So the title of this message, again, is When Tragedy Hits Home, A Biblical View of How to See and Deal with the Worst Life Can Bring. Here's the theme. On this 21st anniversary of 9-11, it is good to remind ourselves of God and His perspective 
on the worst he allows of what people can do. It is good to be reminded of that. And the application is to remember nothing someone can ever do to anyone is greater than what God has already done for everyone. And I don't say that lightly. A dear, dear friend of mine, I remember when it happened a few years ago, I shared it here, a dear, dear friend of mine, his stepdaughter was murdered by her boyfriend when she went to break up with him. Killed her, killed himself. I remember getting the call from, from him and, and just talking through that. Nobody saw that coming. So I'll say it again. Remember nothing someone can ever do to anyone is greater than what God has already done for everyone. All of us who are old enough to remember September 11, 2001 will never forget September 11, 2001. All of you who are old enough to remember it, right? You're never going to forget that day. Ever, ever, ever. That evening, President George W. Bush wrote these words in his journal. Today was this generation's Pearl Harbor. Isn't that profound? And so began a new day in the United States of America that lingers to this day. One example of this is how that prior to 9-11, anyone, anyone was able to go straight to the gate in the terminal to greet their loved ones and friends as they deplaned. That will probably never happen again. And it all changed on September 11th. That's one of many things that changed. Closer to home, it's in our lives when tragedy hits and heartache arrives at the hands of someone else that we discover who we really are, who God really is, and how horribly people can behave. Isn't that the truth? When it punches you in the gut, when it hits you in the face, when you can't get away from it, that's when we learn some things about ourselves and about God and about other people. It's who God really is to which we must cling, of course. And boy, that would be the sermon in a sentence here this morning. It's to God uh, who, it, it's who God really is to which we must, uh, to which we must cling. So uh, turn back to Genesis chapter 6. We're going to begin there. Uh, Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6 explains to us, reveals to us, tells us what, what precipitated the flood. This wasn't just something God did on a whim, obviously. So, the first point this morning is this. When tragedy, and note that it doesn't say if, that's just an important thing to note. When tragedy hits home, we do well to remember that, yes, while God allows it, it hurts his heart too. He doesn't allow it in a disinterested, distant way. It breaks his heart. It, it absolutely does, under that first point. God's the one who decides and determines what the story is and how the story goes. No matter what the story is, your story, my story, any story's story, God ultimately is the one who decides and determines what the story is and how the story goes. So it's in uh, Genesis 6, 8. 6, 5 through 8, that we read these words. <clears throat> the, and, and again, let this, let this uh, find its way to your heart as you hear this. The Lord saw, saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That brief passage there explains the flood's arrival. And when it says he regretted, um, if you look up that Hebrew word, it has a myriad of, of, uh, of, of ways to interpret it. Some translations say he repented, he, he had changed his mind. What it's connected to is the agony of the consequence of a choice that was made. God's the one who decided to create Adam and Eve. And, and so when, when he saw, again, listen to that first verse. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. 
Now, I don't think that literally means 24-7 evil, 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 but a consistent propensity and predisposition toward wickedness was being expressed in some gross ways if you read the beginning of that chapter. And so, so there's a sense where God says enough. And, and there's a sense too when, when he sent his son to die on the cross that God said enough in the story of redemption. And, and that this is, this is finished is what Jesus said on the cross. This rescue that isn't just set in place but set in motion. Coming back to this, it is in Genesis 6 that we see the reason behind the flood. And it's verse 6 specifically that says it, that the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. Deeply troubled. I remember a bereaved father telling the story of his son's death and being in the funeral procession on the way to the cemetery. I remember him describing that. His son was killed and he's in the hearse, in the car behind the hearse, and he's there on the way to the cemetery, and he described what happened there. And, and the pain of that, um, there's no way to categorize it. There's no way to measure it. It's, it's the worst pain a person can ever experience, the loss of a child. And God didn't just in that sense lose a child. He lost the whole human race. They, they went so far away from him in so far the wrong way that all that was happening now was a, a, a perpetual wickedness. And I, even standing here right now, I, I realize as bad as things are, if God hadn't wiped out that deep, dark expression, I mean, th what's the first thing that happened after Adam and Eve sinned? What's the first big sin that happened? Murder, right out of the gate. Right out of the gate. Cain kills his brother Abel from Adam and Eve disobeying God. And so it got so bad so fast that God made this decision. And it is still uh, a, a difficult world in which we live. But again, the story is not over. That's a big part of the second point that we'll get to. It's important to remember that while what breaks God's heart should break our hearts too. The guy who started, uh, I can't remember the ministry and I can't remember his name. But it's a great quote. Made, and it's a prayer. He has made the things that break the heart of God break my heart. Well, the, other, the flip side of that is, is the, thing that break, the things that break our heart break God's heart. The same way a loving, parent, a loving parent's heart is broken when their child's heart is broken. The reciprocity is real. We, God's given us a human heart, and somehow, because we're created in His image, part of our expression, as, even in our human heart, connects back to the heart of God. And as sure as, as our heart should be broken by the things that break the heart of God, God's heart is broken by the things that break our heart. There's no doubt about it. See that clearly in this passage. And, and then, um, yeah, just how important it is to remember that, that, that he's not, God is not disinterested in any way. In fact, it's just the opposite. At Columbine, at Chardon, at Uvalde, at all the high schools were, or all the schools, elementary schools, where these shootings have taken place, God isn't just distant and different. No, he's, he's there embracing and, and experiencing. We have a great high priest who, you know, it, it's, in that context, it's just been tempted in every way as we are. He knows what it's like to live, in a, to live in a fallen world, and it will rip your heart to pieces sometimes. And God is right in the middle of that, with his broken heart, too. And then it's in John 11, 32 through 37. Uh, many of you are familiar with this. Uh, often when I do funerals, I, I, I reference this to make the point of, I mean, one of the biggest things that comes out of this is, is it's in John chapter 11 where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. That's big news. And it's also in John 11 where we hear these words. We'll just read verses 32 through 37. John 11, 32 through 37. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. Jesus hadn't yet arrived where Lazarus was. <coughs> Mary went out and got in his face and said what she said. And then Mary came. He hadn't even gotten to where, where uh, Lazarus' body was yet. He was on the way. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was, not the place where Lazarus was, and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. It tore him up. It was visceral. 
it's the difference between compassion and empathy. This, this pulled him right into the middle of it. Where have you laid him, he asked. Because he knew why he was there. And isn't it interesting that, that he didn't say, uh, didn't, didn't uh, say anything really in response to what Mary said in that 32nd verse. All he did was ask a question. Basically, where's the body? Where have you laid him? Come and see, Lord, they replied. And then people always say, shortest verse in the New Testament. It is, two words. John eleven thirty five. 35. It doesn't say Jesus laughed. It said Jesus cried. He wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. Speaking of his friend, Lazarus. Lazarus and Mary and Martha were siblings, and Jesus often cycled or, or around, you know, to, to them during his earthly ministry. They were friends. Three siblings and, and Jesus. They, they served him, and he visited them more than a few times. Verse 37. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? It's those kind of questions we ask in our confusion. God, you did this over here, and that didn't seem too difficult for you. Why can't you do? Why can't you do that over here? Oh, this over there. Why can't you that over there? Why can't you do this over here? Uh, you seem inconsistent. He, he 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 can open blind eyes. He can do miracles, but he can't keep his friend from dying. And of course, this is again goes back to his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He's redeeming everything as he allows things to unfold. But. It is in John eleven thirty five that we find the shortest verse in the New Testament, and it is simply that Jesus wept. Nobody needs to be taught to learn how to laugh. Some of us need to be taught to learn how to cry. And there's no way to, see, to say conclusively, because it's not revealed to us, why he was crying. Was he crying out of compassion for uh, his friend Lazarus' death? Was he just crying with the, in response to the, the tears that he saw? You know that sometimes you're with somebody and they're crying, and then you just start crying because they're crying. And, and we don't know why. That we don't know what the specific reason is that he cried. But certainly it was in the context of tears and anger that he encountered that he cried. Was he angry at the anger? <laughs> why did he cry? All we know is he cried. Before we move on to the second point, let me unpack that story a little more about the brother who lost his son that I mentioned earlier. This brother who lost his son was a pastor. And his son died at the hands of his friend who was drunk driving a car. The kid driving the car didn't die. His son died. And, and think about the implications of this. This son of his who died was with his friend who was the son of a family in the church and he had to go to the hospital to minister to them while their son is in you know in in uh, harm's way for sure all the while having to live with the fact that his son is now gone so he shows up in a pastoral role to serve this family whose son was in a car accident and as a father he's dying himself can you imagine the emotional just dissonance inside of him? Well, I mentioned when he was in the procession on the way to the cemetery. Here's what he said. He's sitting in the car behind the hearse. He sees the hearse with the coffin with his son's body in it, going to the cemetery. He said it hit him so hard that he was struggling to breathe and he was clutching his heart, just gasping for breath, unable even to really cry fully or freely because his heart was so broken. The grief, the grief was incapacitating to him. It just hit him. He's, and he's, he's not sure he's even gonna make it because his heart is, is, being, is broken so deeply. And he said, that he wouldn't be surprised as he read that verse in Genesis 6, 6, where it said God's heart was pained, that he had a taste how much, of how much it hurt God's 
heart to see the way things were on earth. Again, he wasn't indifferent. He wasn't distant. He wasn't disinterested. His heart was broken when he saw the people he loved doing the things he hated, and all they wanted to do was the things he hated. So, so with that understanding, again, acknowledging the first point says that, yes, while God allows it, it hurts his heart too. He takes no pleasure in any of the things he allows that, that, that tear our hearts to pieces. Somehow, for whatever reason he can see and know from heaven, he allows them fully aware that he can redeem even the worst of it. He can redeem even the worst of it. But while it's happening, there is no doubt he, the, he's, he, his, heart, his heart continues to be torn. It's just, it just boggles my mind sometimes that he hasn't just called it and come back and ended it all. Because there's so many terrible, tragic things that are happening that people do to people, let alone what nature might do and what God might allow that way. I digress. The second point is this. When tragedy hits home, we do well to remember that all that harms, harasses, hurts, and hinders here. All of it is passing away. One day there'll be no more funerals. One day there'll be no more cancer di diagnosis, or however you say that. Nobody will be diagnosed with cancer. Uh, one day nobody will be get, get behind a wheel drunk and kill somebody. One, th th this day is coming. But until that day, all of that stuff is passing away. Under the second point. No matter the struggle or heartache, God's grace is enough. And somebody, and I can imagine somebody who's just gotten punched in the gut by life or by what somebody's done, saying, well, Lottie, what and da, Dan? Thanks for sharing that. You know, uh, no matter the struggle or heartache, God's grace is enough. And there's a time where somebody might even say to you, just shut up. Don't say a word right now. I know that's true, but I, don't, I, can't, I can't hear that right now. Just be quiet. We'll, we'll see what Job's friends did. They were great when they kept their mouth shut. Don't, don't say anything to me right now. Trial Paris, I mentioned it just in the last few weeks, I think. Uh, the song, Do I Trust You, Lord? Um, I know the doctrine and theology, but right now they don't mean much to me. This time there's only one thing I've got to know. Do I trust you, Lord? You allowed something that I can't. I can't explain it. It makes no sense. I didn't ask for it. I didn't invite it. And yet here it is. But I can say with confidence based on the veracity and the authority of the word of God that no matter the struggle or heartache, God's grace is enough. Can you imagine having lunch with Job in heaven? As he looks back on all that, I bet you a lot of people are going to ask him to tell that story. I bet you he'd be glad to tell it because of how it ends. And we're gonna to get to that in just a minute. Not glad to tell it, but grateful to remember to be able to say, let me tell you how good God has been in spite of what God allowed. Let me tell you. <laughs> Romans 16, 20, we're gonna start there. And just, well, before we do that, let me say this. This point is the point that puts us in the place and the position to carry on without caving in. Let me say that again. This truth that when tragedy hits home, in any of its painful varieties, when tragedy hits home, we do well to remember that all that harms, harasses, hurts, and hinders here is passing away. So again, this second point puts us in the place to carry on without caving in. There'll, there'll be times that you feel like you're caving in. There'll be times that you feel that you can't carry on. But you'll look back over this and, and be able to say, that, again, the classic, the footprint, the footprints poem. Right? We all know that. Where were you, God? Where were you? I was carrying you. You didn't even know. And for many of us, that's that's going to be the, the, the story we tell. So let's look at each of these verses and just make some closing observations. It's, we're, uh, Romans 16, 20. This is the, the first uh, epistle in the New Testament. 
Um, the book of Acts is a bridge between the Gospels and the book of Romans. The book, and I haven't said this for a while, I need to do that just for the sake of uh, uh, Biblical Interpretation 101. Uh, the book of Acts is primarily descriptive, not prescriptive. The book of Acts primarily describes what happened as the church was established. The book of Romans is where God speaks concerning doctrine. And um, so it's in Romans 16, 20, the very end of it, where Paul is writing to the, obviously, the citizens of Rome, sending some personal greetings. Urbanus, uh, Apelles, uh, you know, look at all those greetings starting in verse 5, verse 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, including greet each other with a holy kiss. He's just telling, he's just telling, he's just saying, say hi to everybody, you know. I mean, this is the reality of relationship and how beautiful it is. But look at verse 20 in, in uh, Romans 16. Because they were, they, were, they were dealing with the reality of this battle. As soon as you get right with God, you get wrong with the world, and you get really wrong with the enemy, Satan. Um, wrong with the world in many ways, not the world itself. The systems of the world, the principalities and powers that are maneuvered ultimately by the enemy. But look at by the enemy. But look at that 21st and the 16th chapter, and just take it at face value. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Putin, Hitler. The, the, the worst that the enemy can orchestrate through the people who will cooperate with him. And isn't it interesting that he doesn't say the God of vengeance or the God of justice or the God of, the God of uh, anything else, the God of love, though he's all of those. He says the God of peace will soon crush Satan, not under my feet, but under your feet. Think of that. So basically, what I hear when I hear that is, uh, again, hold on, because the God of peace will soon do that. Just hold on. It hasn't happened yet. The enemy is still raging. The enemy is still warring. That third verse of a mighty fortress, and though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, that's still going on, and all the rest of that verse that Martin Luther wrote about. Yes, it's still going on, but it won't be going on forever. All that harms and harasses and hurts and hinders here will one day be no more. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And he goes on to say, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. The grace of Jesus that's always, always victorious. And then turn with me to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. If you get to Timothy, you've gone too far. If you haven't gotten to Colossians yet, you're not there yet. 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. And in 2 Thessalonians, just want to acknowledge this passage and, and then make this observation. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Um, am I in the right place? Chapter 2. I said chapter 3. Chapter 2, verses... I'm not sure what I said, but I know it's supposed to be 2, 15 through 17. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. And this is the key to the next two verses. Listen to what we've said, because God has inspired that. They knew that, the teaching that they'd given them. Again, stand firm. Hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you. These scriptures are what's going to are what's going to bring you life and keep you alive. And then verses sixteen and seventeen. May our Lord Jesus Himself and God our Father, who loved us and by His grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. That's how you quit playing defense and start playing offense. That's how we do make the step with great strides to, to keep moving forward by God's grace. And so, especially uh, verses 16 and 17 here, that, that we're just instructed based on God's love for us. 
and by the grace. And don't you love that phrase, eternal encouragement? Not fleeting, not temporary, but eternal encouragement and good hope. And I, I, I so often immediately go to this and differentiate between them. It does not say, encourage your minds and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Encourage your hearts. Because that's where the battle is. The core of who you are is where the battle really is. Your thoughts are fleeting. Your thoughts can be fickle. They can be false. But, the, but the, the, where our heart is, anytime anybody has heart, and so often we're encouraged not to lose heart, but to, to, to stay strong, stay strong of heart. That's, that's where courage and, 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 and encouragement really uh, take root and bear fruit. How many times uh, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart? Where your heart is, there your treasure will be. Not where your mind is. Where your heart is, there your treasure will be. It's the seat of our existence. The seat of our existence. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. And before we conclude here this morning, I definitely again feel the need to cycle back to that 15th verse because that's how this is going to happen. Stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. Listen to what God has to say. And do it. And see all of this from his perspective. And then last but not least, Revelation 21. I said often when I'm, when I'm asked to do a funeral, I'll, I'll find our, our way at that gathering of, of family and friends who are so heartbroken to John chapter 11 where Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life. What a great thing to say at a funeral. And in uh, Revelation 21, often when if I accompany the family to the to the cemetery, to the to the gravesite. I will, when it's appropriate and when it's uh, true for that person. Revelation 21, 1 through 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or sorrow or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Some translations say faithful and true. He said to me, it is done. Does that resonate with it is finished? It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. So again... Because of that, based on the fact that all that heart hurts and harasses and hinders and harms us here in this life that is passing, this awaits us. And no matter what happens between now and then, no matter what happens in that space of time, um, whatever tragedies, whatever heartache, whatever unsolicited and, unsolicited and unexpected thing comes your way, no matter what it is, or no matter when it comes, and no matter how it arrives, that's where we can, thinking back to that verse in um, 2 Thessalonians, stand firm. You don't have the final say-so, whatever it is. You don't have the final say-so, including death. Death is the second to the last word for every believer. It's not the last word. This is the last word. This is how it's going to be. And knowing that, oh my, that this is all actually going to happen. Uh, but it does remind us, and I'll just say this, aren't you glad that Job's story doesn't end in chapter 2? Where it talks about his three friends sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. None of them said a word, not him, because they saw how great his suffering was. Earlier, his wife told him to curse God and die. And don't be too hard on her. Her kids were taken from her. Everything was taken from her except her husband. So don't be too hard on her. 
but acknowledge. I'm so grateful that Job doesn't, isn't just two chapters long because there's so much more to learn from it, especially as it concerns suffering and, and tragedy, all of which Job and his wife knew. And as you see at the end of Job, it, 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 it clearly says um, that, well, yeah, I have, it, I have it there. Let's turn back to Job. Job chapter uh, 42. And, and it's in Job chapter 42, verse 12, that we find these words. And even as I read, after I read them, I'll, I'll make this observation, and then we really will come in for landing. Uh, Job chapter 42 and verse 12, uh, the scriptures say, The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. And the former part of Job's life, that was all taken away from him, the former part of Job's life was blessed, 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 blessed. And it says clearly that the Lord blessed the latter part of Joseph's life more than the former part. And, and that is, is, is not to say that what happened before wasn't beyond tragic. But it is to say, again, that the story is not over until God says the story is over. And as sure as Job did not see what came in chapter 1 and chapter 2, he, I'm sure he did not see what came in chapter 42 either. He thought it was over. He thought it was done. Comes to mind, I'll say this one last thing. Family we know uh, from our earlier days, in the beginning days of ministry, lost uh, their, their, their house and a lot of their belongings in a, in a house fire. Today they'll tell you that was one of the best days of their life. What? They been drinking? No. It wasn't the best day of their life when it happened. But what that fire and the destruction of their home did and their, some of their very personal belongings that can never be replaced, what that did is shake loose from their life any connection that's inappropriate to stuff. For the rest of their lives, they were free because everything they had got burned down in, their, in, in the earlier days. Do you see that? That there's nothing good about that fire. There's nothing good about everything they lost. There's nothing, nothing good in and of itself. But the, the great result that came out of that, for the rest of their life, they were the happiest, freest guys. What, what, well, what if it happens again to your house? Well, what if it happens again to our house? We're fine. You know? The, the, the lessons you can learn that way that you wouldn't learn other, other ways. So if ever there was a time, especially as you think of the book of Job, if ever there was a time for, but wait, there's more, uh, that this, this would be that story. I'll end with a, a video clip I saw just recently of Tom Hanks with a couple other Hollywood, you know, very, very famous people. And it was just a candid conversation that Tom, and Tom Hanks was speaking. And Tom Hanks said something along these lines. I, I, I tried to find it, but I couldn't find it. You can probably find it if you Google it long enough. Tom Hanks is quoted as saying, uh, you know, and it's a, it's a biblical worldview. I'm not sure where he is with God, but he, it's the phrase that we often say. This too, what? Shall pass. This too shall pass. And then Tom Hanks just starts riffing on that phrase. This too shall pass. He says something along these lines. When it's good, when it's bad, this too shall pass. Is it really good? This too shall pass. Is it really bad? This too shall pass. When it's easy, when it's hard, this too shall pass. When people love you, when people hate you, this too shall pass. When you succeed and when you fail, this too shall pass. When you don't think anything could slow you down, and when you don't think anything can get you going, this too shall pass. No matter where, that's, that's part of just reality 101 too, life. No matter what your state is right now, if you would say this is a really good season of life, this too will pass. If you would say this is a really painful and difficult season of life, this too will pass. That's part of what this tells us this morning. It's all going to pass. And eventually it's all going to pass for the final time one day. So life really is like this. And like, you know, those roller coasters now that uh, just don't go forward, they go up and down and around. Um, that's how life can be. It, 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 this too shall pass. Wherever you're at on the roller coaster, this too shall pass. You're going to come home. You're going to get off. You're going to be okay. No matter what's going on, this too shall pass. It's the same thing to say in a world that can seem insane. That's for sure. Here's the making your real questions. Uh, connected to that first point, when tragedy hits home, uh, we do well to remember that, yes, while God allows it, it hurts his heart too. Have you considered this? 
How does it bring perspective to what God allows? The things that break your heart, the things that hurt your heart, the things you hate, the things, you know, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, that I want to change yesterday, those kind of things. It, it messes with God's heart if it messes with your heart. He feels it. He cares. He's compassionate. He's empathetic. And then the second question, connected to when tragedy hits home, we do well to remember that all that harms, harasses, hurts, and hinders here is passing away. Will you ask God to give you eternal eyes for all of life's blessings and battles? Easy question to ask. I, I pray that you and I can and will do that sincerely. God, help me see this the way you see it, even though I'm stuck in the middle of it. I'm, I'm, I'm caught between the now and the not yet, but you're, you're already way on the other side of this. Help me see this with that understanding. Help me see this knowing that this story isn't over. Help me know that. Because it's the truth. And help me know this. Because I'm your child, by your amazing grace, it is going to be okay. Even if nothing's okay right now, it's going to be okay. And it's going to be okay forever. That's such good news. The action step is think about the biggest punch or punches in the gut that life has given you. And while just doing that brings the awareness of the pain again, and I don't, I don't mean to do that just for the sake of rehearsing or rehashing. When you think about that punch to the gut, some emotions may accompany it. But ask God for his perspective on it all. And look for the ways he has and will be redeeming it all. And I wanted to end with this verse before we close in prayer. I meant to uh, mention it earlier. And as I was tightening up my notes this morning, I realized that I did Psalm 147, verse 3. If, 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 we were, if I was uh, handing out a verse for the week, it would be this. Psalm uh, 147 and verse 3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. In this life, he does that. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for being with us here on earth as well. We ask for the grace to live the life you intend for and through us, come what may. Today, we've acknowledged just how painful and ugly life can be and it's hard it's very hard help us to remember that you know and that what breaks our hearts breaks your heart too help us to respond to the worst the world can give with your kindness and perspective and love and we would lift all those who are still living in the grief of those events that were mentioned at the beginning here we think especially of those who lost their loved ones 21 years ago today. Thousands in the towers, hundreds on the planes. First responders that never had a chance to respond first again. all the families and the loved ones of those who still hurt so deeply from that terrible day. And help us really, really believe, not, not just believe, but know that all that and all this hurts your heart too. Pause even now, just in silence to us as we lift to you. Silence to us, but not to you, that, that we lift to you. Those who were aware of, who need to know you know, and you care and you're able.
this time together, God, thanking you for everything that is good and beautiful in this world. Puppy dogs and flowers and horses, a good meal, friends, sunrises, sunsets. Help us never forget the simple pleasures and the gentle graces of life that are real and refreshing and good. And as we go from these holy moments, we do so praying in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, here's the benediction this morning. May the grace of God from the God of all grace be yours in the fullest measure this coming week. Go now to reflect his light, his life, his power, his peace, his love.